Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Living Room, where we listen, learn, and live together. I'm your host, Richard Martin. Make yourself right at home. I'm glad you're here. In his book, You'll Get Through This, Hope and Help for Turbulent Times, Christian author Max Lucado says, you'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. But God will use this mess for good. So don't be foolish and or naive. With God's help, you will get through this. And our special guest today knows what it means to go in, journey through, and emerge on the other side of adversity with courage, strength, and determination. One of the original Freedom Riders, whose story in part is featured in the hit movie Freedom Riders, he has spoken to upwards of 2 million students, educators, and leaders with his authentic, inspiring message. And I and but one of those two million. Would you please welcome to the living room with me, my brother, Mr. Manny Scott. What's going on, man? What's up, good people? So <laughs> good to see you, man. Thank you for having me. You too. Listen, just let me thank you um, for the opportunity to not only have this conversation, but I've been tracking with you for the past, man, three years or so now. First, my wife and I were first made aware of your story and your ministry. Um, the initiatives that you implement as a, as a change agent, really, in sunny Chicago. Now, Chicago is not always sunny. Uh, right. So it was, it was August of 2018. You were one of the featured speakers at a large educators event there. And um, to be honest, how we walked in, we were there for one of the workshops. One of our friends was doing a workshop, but we got there early for the main keynote. We walked in, found a seat. You're talking about thousands of of, of student leaders, of educators, principals, superintendents, and introduction. Please welcome Manny Scott. And it's the best, right? When you've not heard of someone before, you've got no expectations. You're just like, let's hear it. Man, right. bro, you remember this. By the end of that thing, folk were crying. <laughs> People were laughing, yeah. cheering. And I'm not saying this as, 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 you know, those in my generation, a little younger, say no smoke, man. I am serious. That was a life-changing <laughs> And my wife like we were God like bless you brother oh so um appreciate wow. you and, and i know that, that was a special day man that was uh, a very special day it really yeah. was um <laughs> yeah special in all caps man i think that and i'm sure you you'll share more of this as we talk the different kinds of experiences that you've been privileged to have over sure. this 20 year or so period in professional speaking but uh, I think you know what it's like, and I have a sense of it too, as a pastor speaker, you know, there are certain moments where it's almost like, metaphorically speaking, the stars align and there's speaker, listener connectivity. You know, it's one of those special moments where you prepare for, but you also realize there's a great deal of this you can't manufacture. <laughs> and uh, that, at least for me and my wife and those in our little pocket of the auditorium, you could just feel like, we're all on the same page in this moment. And when it's over, we get a chance to exhale with gratitude, go on with our lives. And um, yeah, man, so so for those who don't know, buckle up, listen up, you're going to want to um, really be in tune as we share. Um, you, you, you shared a tweet recently. Um, it says, the experiences that are discouraging and draining to you and pushing you to your limits are making you stronger. I've been there thousands of times. You said, don't give up. You are greater than your circumstances. Get yourself up, get yourself ready and give your best today, believe. Now, in a sense, this tweet, man, has been like years in the making for you. And I know this is, this is, kind, of, this is kind of early to kind of dive into the deep end, but, but let's go, man. You know by personal experience, Manny, pain, disappointment, Oh, and adversity. So I just kind of want to throw it in your court, take as much time as you need. Man, describe what was life like for you growing up? Man, look, we starting off with the deep. <laughs> we starting <laughs> off. So yeah, man, no, that, that I just posted that the other day um, because I know people are in a really rough place right now, especially teachers, but pastors, a lot of people right in the trenches. And uh, I feel it. They inbox me, they DM me. And uh, I'm like, I, I've been there thousands of times and I, I, that was, you know, it's probably been tens of thousands of times, brother, just that, that dark place. Yeah. I know well, like <laughs> very well um, because of my journey. So I come from a, a beautiful mixed family, black, Mexican, white, um, 
but a very broken family. Hmm. My, my pops has been locked up most of my life. Um, I've seen him about 50, 11 times for about 15 hours total. Hmm. Um, my, and he, he's got, he's out of prison now, but you know, I reach out to him and just, it's, it's not been the greatest. Um, my stepfather was a hardworking man, but he was addicted to crack. He was an alcoholic and, um, talked to my little brother last night. Uh, and apparently my stepfather, he's, uh, he's still drinking and, you know, still going through a rough time. And, but when he got drunk or high, he used to beat my mother mm. and me and my brothers would try to fight him. Um, but I was a little boy, man, like fighting a grown man, you know, getting thrown off of balconies and just, it was bad. Um, I lived in 26 places before I was 16, uh, homeless shelters. I used to sleep on this cold slab of concrete wow. around people addicted to drugs, women in prostitution, people who were addicted to alcohol, um, just crying myself to sleep. Um, you know, my mom, she was, she, I remember she took her jacket off and cause I didn't no blanket, no pillow, no mattress. We just, we were just on the floor. Yeah. My, my mom covered me with her jacket and she said, baby, it's going to be all right. And um, as much as I wanted to believe it, man, it wasn't all right. Mm -hmm. It was not all right. Like we were struggling, man. Like I was, I used to jump into dumpsters to find food to eat. You know, I closed the lid over the top of these dumpsters and like sift through garbage just to try to find something to help me make it through the night. And, um, and I took all those issues with me to school. Yeah. So, you know, I'm sitting in class with people who, who got nice situations at the house, you know, two parents, or if, even if one, they got food to eat, they got like a healthy environment. And, and I'm, you know, I'm sitting there with holes in my pants and holes in my shoes. And, uh, you know, everyone else got a backpack and I don't even like in in a lunch pail. And I'm like, man, people got food at home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, you know, just a lot of that. Um, looking for hope and encouragement from teachers, from counselors, from anybody, but instead they clowned me, they roasted me, you know, skin color, where I lived, my parents, my shoes, like you name it. Even teachers were just, they were, they would shame me, embarrass me in front of the class. And uh, so that shaped me and I, so I hated school. And I started ditching school from fourth grade to ninth grade. I did 60 to 90 days a year. Um, just running the streets, man, hanging out with guys who were older than me. I was 11 and they were like 18, 19 high school dropouts, drug dealers, gang members. Those guys protected me. They became my family and I lost all of them. Uh, most of them were killed or in jail or are in jail now. Um, so all of this is going on. I'm smoking weed at 11 years old, getting drunk at 11 years old, uh, broken in my first house, stole my first car when I was 11 years old, got the ugliest tattoo you will ever see on <laughs> when I was 11 years old. Yeah, for when sure. I, when I was drunk and high, man, sitting, I was sitting on a bed with two people doing something that affected the stability of my mattress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's terrible, terrible. 11 years old. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so you know, I was just struggling. First semester of my freshman year in high school, I earned a 0 0.6 mm. GPA. And second semester, I dropped out. And, um, and so, you know, when I talk about being in that dark place, thousands of times, like it's, I'm just sharing with you the tip of the tip of the iceberg. In just a little bit I shared with you, man, there's been so much death and tragedy and sorrow and heartbreak and depression and suicidal thoughts. Um, my best friend was murdered on his way to see me. Um, mm. So, so that's, that's the, that's the, the journey that like, when I think of pain, you know, and there's been thousands of events even since then, but that was up to about 16 years old. Um, and, and so from there, you know, man, several loving people came into my life. And mm. I dropped out of high school, you know, I'm just running the streets. I was getting chased by helicopters. I mean, I was wilding out in Long Beach, California. Um, um, people shooting at us, like it was all bad. But it was there, man, that a man addicted to crack came and sat down next to me on a park bench and he shared the gospel with me, mm. addicted to crack. Um, 
He was sleeping behind a dumpster. But uh, the Lord put it on his heart to come talk to me. Yeah. And so this, this brother sitting next to me shares the gospel with me. And there on a park bench, man, the Lord met me there. And, you know, so, you know, that scripture in Romans 1 where it says the gospel is the power of God and the salvation yeah. to those who believe the gospel, the message of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, is the means by which God transfers people from the hands of hell into his kingdom. Yeah. And uh, so it was the message, not the messenger that saved me. And it was on a park bench, man. The Lord met me there through a, a brother addicted to crack. From there, I started going to a little house church, a little church plant, three or four people. I would sit at the table and they'd be reading the Bible and I'd just be sitting there like, man, I don't know how to read like this. Like, and yeah. they would pray for me and read. And, and it was there that, you know, I got to see what a healthy family looks like. And I returned to school and ended up, you know, getting five A's and two B's and <laughs> placed in the back of a little white lady named Erin Gruel. Yeah. The freedom writer teacher who saw something in me and she's like no nah, you got to go to college so i become the first person in my family to graduate from high school go to college um got a master's degree mdiv uh yeah. and uh, finishing my phd right now in intercultural communication competence in chicago i'm a pilot i'm a happily married man to my college yes, sweetheart yes sir and uh i've got three wonderful children you know so I've become the father I never had. I've mm. become the husband I've never seen in my family. And uh, we've been to, what, 49 states and six continents now as a family. So, wow. you know, by God's grace, the, the loving help of several other people, pastors, teachers, counselors, administrators, lunch ladies, bus drivers, yeah. and very, very hard work, brother. I've, uh, I've turned the page and this really with me all things have become new yes sir. and i've broken so many cycles it, with the help of an amazing wife you know i could tell you about her she comes from a beautiful strong christian family right and so i've learned through her about her father and what it means to be a dad and all of that stuff but now i'm just doing my best man to to use all of the pain of my past yeah to to inspire and encourage and help others and give others hope who feel hopeless. Like I, if you feel like giving up, if you feel like killing yourself, man, I've been there and yeah. you can't give up because it can get better. So that's that's what I've been doing for 20 years, man. Just over two, 2 million people, teachers, coaches, counselors, schools, jails, juvenile halls, detention centers, uh, uh, prisons, hospitals, cemeteries, brother, you name it. Wherever there's a need for hope, I've been there. I've been in cornfields with megaphones. Man, you name it. I've probably I've been I've spoken to circus concessionaires, to farmers, to haymakers. Man, look, wherever there's a need for hope, like and, and I'm available, I'm trying to go. So yeah. that's that's what I've been up to really for the last 20 years now. There's a Christian musical artist who has a song called Chain Breakers, Zach Williams. And uh, one of the lines in the chorus says, if you need freedom and saving. He's a prison shaking savior. Yes, sir. He's a chain breaker. And I appreciate you sharing, man, really from the vaults of your experience, because I know it resonates with me and so many others who, who are listening. Sometimes it's a misnomer. People can act as if they don't believe children, preteens, yeah. teens are really facing and dealing with not play play, yeah. not fake manufactured things. Um, in fact, I'm sure there are no shortage of students who have come to school bearing the marks, showing all the signs and indicators that, hey, everything's not well. Um, some of them maybe even using what vocabulary they have are articulating it, but maybe not being met with sincerity. And so for you to share and say, hey, listen, man, by 11 years old, right, 11 years old, yeah, I'm yeah. in a completely different world. Like, I'm not going to Legoland. We're not talking about happy meals at McDonald's with a little toy. You know, this isn't cartoons in the afternoon. <laughs> like I am running the streets. I mean, as you were sharing, just stealing your first car at 11, I'm saying, man, I think I was trying to sit on my dad's lap or something like that to drive. 
And yeah. again, that you oriented to that with us and let us know, hey man, some of my greatest transition moments came from a person who was willing to have a conversation with me on a park bench. Uh, how old were you at that critical impasse with this brother on that park bench? Man, I want to say I was 14. I believe I was 14 years old uh, because it was it was the first semester of my freshman year of high school when I dropped out. So mm. I was about 14 years old. Okay. Um, so so yeah, it's uh, and to your point though about kids, y y you know, like I've been invited and spoken at thousands of school wide assemblies and um sometimes they'll bring me into like even wealthy districts predominantly white districts and you know the superintendent might might have been the person to invite me in but the principal really knew nothing about me and so mm -hmm. i get there and i'm like what you know what do your kids need to hear what are the challenges they're facing and it's pretty much like a like just tell them to dream big they have good lives you know and then get out yeah. of here like that's the energy i'm like are you sure there's nothing else you need me to address no just tell them to dream big and get out of here like you know that's that's yeah. it and i'm like and so i'll start talking to the kids you know a thousand kids and i'll just start asking questions like so real quick um i can't help you if i don't know you and i don't want to assume that where i'm from is the same as where you're from or that my normal is your normal teach me about you so we can make the most of our time together how many of you have been crying yourself to sleep at night how many of you, and man, thousands, or like just through the years, but let's just in this one assembly, hundreds of kids, wealthy kids, you know, um, val you know, just the bright kids, honor roll students, student body present, standing up sobbing. How many of you have been, uh, you feel neglected by your parents? They throw money at you, but you just want to be loved. How many of you have been seriously thinking about killing yourself? Man, hundreds of thousands of young people across this nation standing there sobbing and teachers and administrators are like just blown away like there's no way so it's not just manny telling them his story i need i'm showing you your kids now you mm. don't, don't feel sorry for me don't pity me i'm here to help you see it's your kids your kids right now all over this nation are in need of hope and help and i if this does not open your eyes if this does not renew your commitment to teaching then you're in the wrong profession because mm once you i think I, I don't know who says it but seeing begins uh once you how did he say it? but this brother essentially said when you see uh your calling begins when seeing begins so when you see the burdens and the pains of the people around you your calling should be awakened and if it doesn't you know if that doesn't remind you of your why maybe you need to find a new where because mm. kids today need help um back in the day maybe you know i might have been a minority of the students going through these kinds of things or at least you know i didn't talk about it so maybe there were others but i my my situation was bad schools are filled now with a bunch of little manny scots wow. uh, black white latino asian native american and um and so many schools are forcing content and teaching curriculum and i'm like look let me tell you something you these you're not gonna help these kids or reach these kids until you understand these kids sure. and you should under you should spend as much time understanding your students as you do understanding your content and build a bridge there because yeah. these kids today if you can't meet them on their level there's nothing you can do there's no content you can share that with them that will help them yeah. uh, or that they'll even be interested in so the pain is real it's pervasive um i thought people would stop inviting me and I could get back to the pastor. I yeah. thought, you know, Lord, like, let me just get back to pastoring a church, a small church. Let me just be in community and they're going to leave me alone, man. They like, it's just snowballed to where like I could be speaking every single day of the year if I accepted every invitation. And so I've been working to just try to find the right kind of people to help with this work because right. it'll kill you. It will yeah, yeah. kill you. So it's adversity. The kind of experiences you, you're sharing, man, they're no respecter of persons or communities. I think even now there might still be kind of a, a, a um, preconceived notion or assumption that, hey, the kinds of things Manny's talking about, you know, those kinds of challenges, it only happens on this side of town with yeah. this group of kids, you know, from these kinds of communities or backgrounds but from what i'm hearing traveling you know man 300 give or take days a year 
like you said, from cornfields to, you know, near stadiums, you're saying, man, brother, Rich, this, this is not just a certain shade of skin, a certain yes, so, right. a socioeconomic um, reality, human beings, people, whatever, yo, they got some real stuff. And I appreciate you hitting that right on the head. Um, and yet, Absolutely. I'm sure you've seen this, right? Like, not everyone has a, well, let me not put it like that. We all, when it comes to turning the page, live within that tension of like reality, believing that that's a possibility for me. I can do it. I'm experiencing it. And then also maybe something mitigating that says, now nah, that can't be you. That's Manny's story, but that's not you. Man, sure. why do we struggle to turn the pages in our personal experience? And then yeah. after you share that, man, what steps can a person who's listening, watching right now, they're saying, you're speaking to me. I'm not even a teenager anymore. You know, I'm, I'm in my thirties, but I haven't turned the page from stuff in the back. How can they turn the page to begin writing a new chapter? Oh, absolutely, man. Listen, so you reminded me, like I could, I could tell you stories. So after I'm done speaking um, with students or adults, but I'll just tell you about the students. The students will form a line for the last 20 years, sometimes four or five hours if I let them. And one by one, they'll just come they trust me, they share yeah. some of the most just um, heartbreaking stories with me. Um, so I think I have secondary trauma now because mm -hmm. of the things they've shared with me, just, just like a pastor, you know, people, you carry the burdens of people and you give them to the Lord, but there's some that stay with you yeah. um, that you can't shake, right? So there's, uh, to your point, there's some people who don't, <clears throat> don't even see that change is possible for themselves. Like this young brother walked up to me. I was speaking in, um, in uh, well, there's, there's several, but I'll just tell you one. I was in, in a school after I was done speaking, the kids formed the line and I'm hugging the kids, you know, taking ussies with the kids, clowning and just sure. having a good time afterwards. But there's always a straggler and it's always the stragglers, man, who've changed my life. And so everyone's leaving. And then this young, this young brother walks up slowly. He got tattoos on his face, on his, on his, on his neck. He got tattoos on his knuckles. He's sagging. He's got a bandana hanging out, the, out, of, out of his pants. And uh, he just walks up to me. He ain't smiling. He ain't, and he hands me this uh, manila envelope. I have it around here somewhere. I got to find it. It's a manila envelope. Uh, you know the eight by eleven one, yeah, and it's a sure. it's a it's a little drawing on it, really nice drawing, of a hand like this, with like a shackle or a chain around the wrist, and there's a candle in the palm of the hand, and the candle has a little flame at the top, and, and you guys you could see veins, man, like it was a nice drawing. I he just handed it to me. He didn't say nothing. He just looked at me, handed it to me, and just stared at me. Um, and he just did that. He said, what's up? I said, what's up? And he hands me this envelope and I look at it. He don't say nothing. He just said, I'm like, this is nice, man. You drew this? He said, oh. I'm trying to, you know, what? You know, I'm trying to figure out why you gave me this picture. Like, right. I'm like, okay, what, what, what you want to be, what you want to be when you want to be an artist? That's when you get out of here, you want to be an artist? I don't know. I'm like, man, why you give me this picture, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm tired. Like, I, I didn't tell him that. I'm tired. Like, you know, right. you stand in line long enough. You try to be as gracious as you can. I'm like, man, why you, why you give me this picture? He said this, he said, this hand, is is my hand he said and this candle that's my hope hmm. that's my hope that my life could get better he said that candle he said like i was listening to you speak and um now let me back up right before he told me about the picture right before he, he he looked at me and i'll come back to this he looked at me i said man what why are you giving me this picture he said Man, when I was little, my mama sold me to drug dealers mm. and they raped me. Mm. He said, they raped me and they raped me. 
He said, and when they were done with me, they threw me in a dumpster to die. Um, and he said, uh, my brother found me and his brother was standing against the wall crying, like just his brother, his big brother was just sobbing in the corner. He said, man, he found me. We all each other got. And he raised me, mm. he raised me. And he took the, and then he took the picture from me. He said, this hand is my hand. He said, and this candle is my hope that my life could get better. While I was listening to you, I was saying, man, maybe I could be like him one day because he knows my pain. Maybe I could be like him. He said, but this, this, this handcuff, this handcuff lets me know I ain't gonna be sh-. He yeah. said, I ain't gonna be sh-. He said, I ain't gonna be sh-. He said, look at me, man. You know, I ain't gonna be sh-. He said, I wanna be somebody too. I wanna be like, I wanna be like you, Mr. Scott, but you know, I ain't gonna be sh-. Niggas like me, man, we ain't. And so um, I hugged him and I pleaded with him, man. I'm like, listen, and just for 30 minutes, man, just encouraging this young man, like, listen, man, I understand your pain. And like this, your story doesn't have to end right here. Right. And I encouraged this brother and connected him with some teachers and people who I believe loved him, some men. And I went to my car, man, and I cried, right? Yeah. Like, because there's so many, so many young brothers hurt like that. Um, a year later, I was invited back to speak to the teachers there to go deeper. And I asked about that young man. I'm like, where's he at? They said, Mr. Scott, they said, after your conversation with them, things changed. They said, he turned things around, he graduated, and he's now in college. Mm. I said, get out of here. I said, get out. They said, no, he's in college. And um, and, uh, and and I guess, like, so when I was leaving the school, I, I ran into some of his homies. <laughs> and his homie was like, hey, like, you know, they was tatted up. Yeah. And uh, they was like, you know, I was like, hey, man, I just walk up. I like walking up and introducing myself, getting to know people, you know, like, I, I love these people, man. Like, I understand y'all and I'm not, yeah. I might have a suit and tie on, but don't, don't get it twisted, man. Like, I understand you guys. And they'd be like, man, why are you walking up on us? I'm like, hey man, where's Paul? They said, Paul, who are you? And I'm like, my name is Manny Scott. Oh, you Manny Scott. Hey y'all, this Manny <laughs> Scott, Yo, this is the one who was talking. Come you know? through. <laughs> yeah. And so they said, man, our homie's gone, man. He went to school and, uh, and I was like, praising God, man, because yeah. you, you know, Gardner Taylor, so I, I, I had a chance to meet Gardner Taylor one time, but I, you know, people touch you yeah. and, and, and they change your life and they don't even know it, right? So I believe God doesn't show you all of the fruit of your labor because if you saw all of the fruit, it would get to your head, <laughs> but he shows you just enough yes, sir. to let you know your work is not in vain. Mm. And, and those little stories like that, man, have just, when I've wanted to give up, you know, I'll, I'll hear a story like, you know, Mr. Scott, you changed my life or you gave me hope or I was going to kill myself. But now I'm a counselor and I'm, yes, I'm helping other kids. And those little glimpses, those, that little fruit, man, is encouragement um, for me to keep going. So to answer your question, that young man and so many like him believe that there is no future for them that they can call their own. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe I was going to make it past my 18th birthday. Me and my boys, man, we just, there were 125 young men, black and Mexican men and Asian men killed in our neighborhood just one year alone in Long Beach. Just wow. those are our friends. So we didn't think like you could be at a party, you could be at your homie's house, you could be at a football game and there'll be a shooting or screeching tires. And that's it. Innocent yeah. people did. So for us, like, you don't, you know, just give, give you know, do everything you want to do because we're going to get taken out. So, um, so I understand the hopelessness. Sometimes from my experience, like your beliefs are based on your references that you have. Mm -hmm. Like, so if, if, if you've never seen anyone in your family graduate from high school, in your brain, you believe like we don't graduate from high school. I'm not, yeah. or if you've never seen anyone in your family be 
Uh, if you've never seen a man stay faithful to his wife, then like I didn't, you know, it's not possible for men to stay faithful. That was that was me. Yeah. Um, it's not possible for someone like me to go to college. It's not possible for someone like me to fly airplanes. It's not possible. But then you meet someone who understands your pain, who's been in your circumstances and who has overcome those circumstances, that one person can give you a glimpse of your own possibilities. Mm. And so all of us need references. All of us need examples who can disequilibrate us and give us hope and make, make us see that, man, I'm like him and he's like me. And if he could do it, maybe I can do it too. Yeah. And so I think it starts there. We need to, we need more references in our culture of, of people who have overcome hardship um, and succeeded. Yeah. That alone gives so many people hope. And I don't, a lot of our kids in our schools don't get opportunities to hear people like me because, and they don't think it's possible to do what I've done. Mm -hmm. But when they see me, I don't, white, black, Latino, Asian, Native American, you know, when they see me, it's like, I, right, I wouldn't have believed this story if I didn't see it with my own eyes, but what comes from the heart reaches the heart and the way he talks, I know he's speaking like from a real place sure. and that touches people. So it starts there, but how do you change? How do you, how does the person who's at the bottom, who's discouraged, who feels hopeless change? So this is what I've learned. You know, we're shaped by our cultural backgrounds. We're shaped by our, you know, genetics, our DNA. We're shaped by our personality. We are shaped by the education that we received and we are shaped by the decisions we make. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it's our decisions, not our conditions that ultimately determine our destiny. Yes, sir. M more powerful than your culture, more powerful than your education, more powerful than your background, more powerful than poverty is your power to decide that I want more out of life. Like, it's your power to decide that that you're going no i don't know how i'm gonna do it but i will make it through this that yeah. power to decide to me is the most important power that we have on a park bench a brother shared the gospel with me and i used my power to decide that today i'm giving my life to the lord that today uh even though i looked around me and i didn't see anyone whose life i wanted today man i'm gonna i'm gonna start i'm gonna start I'm gonna start building the kind of life that I want so I can help my mama and I can help my family. Um, when I went back to school, like I didn't know how to study, but I decided I'm gonna figure it out. When I got into Berkeley, I decided, man, I'm gonna go with $20 to my name. It's, it's <laughs> bro, like it's this. And, and when you start getting these little successes because these little decisions, those little successes lead to bigger successes. And yes. before you know it, your life has changed but it starts with the decision. I can't control what happens to me. I can't mm -hmm. control my past, but this day right now, I have the power to decide what my future will be. Mm. I can't control how the story started, but I can't control what I'm gonna do from this day forward. I can't control what happens to me, but I can't control how I respond to it. And today I decide, man, I'm not gonna be a victim. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep crying in my pain. Yeah. I'm not going to keep feeling sorry for myself. No, if, if anything in my life is going to change, it has to start with me. So mm. I'm going to start with me. And I took extreme ownership of my pain and my problems and my life and said, I don't care if nobody else believes in me. I believe in me and I'm going. And that decision that I have to keep making daily, even now at 43 years old, even when like the narrative starts to come back, man, you from the hood, man, you can whatever yeah, yeah. like you you have to combat these negative ideas and replace them with positive empowering ideas and questions and make a decision man and work and do work decide yeah. and do work those are two big things there's more but without a decision nothing changes yeah decide <laughs> and so, do work i remember you sharing um and and i read turning the page from cover to cover so there oh, wow. was that moment in there where you had made that decision. This is after the park bench um, with Brother Marlin and, and you go back to school, but to go back to school, you had to get accepted. And, and I believe there was a particular 
um, educator who was like, nah, bro, you know, you, you, you burned the bridge. That's it. And you were like, no, please, I got to. And they were like, no, please, no, please, no. And, and that could have been another breaking point where it was like, I tried, but that's it. But I think like you're saying that decision and work, it was like, I am not taking no for answer. I will crawl, I will scrape, scrap, whatever I have to do. And that came through for that person. So, yeah, you know, who had, who had influence <laughs> to, to open Mrs. that. Her, her name was Mrs. Wilton. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Wilson, she's a beautiful black woman, man. She almost never smiled. I don't know what Ms. Wilson's been through, but I guess she maybe dealt with a whole lot of Manny Scott. She was yeah. through. Like, she could see through all of the BS. She could yeah. see through all. And uh, I'm like, Ms. Wilton, I want to come back to school. She just looked at me. And she pulled up my transcript. She said, boy, you had a 0 0.6. Yeah. I said, I know, Ms. Wilton. I know I was tripping. She cut me off. She said, son, how you get a D in gym? I'm saying <laughs> I said, I know I was just tri tripping a little, but I'm ready to come back. Mm -hmm. She says, she says, son, um, you're too far behind. I got to send you up the street. And I'm like, and when you got sent up the street in Long Beach, you got sent to this place. Uh, I don't think it's better now, so I won't say its name, but I, you got sent to a place where you people never graduated, usually went to prison or worse. Mm. And I'm, when she threatened to send me up the street, I'm like, I, I pleaded with her because I knew what that meant. And I said, hold on, Ms. Wilm, don't send me up the street. I said, I've been out in the streets and I've learned that the streets ain't for me. I'm like, I don't, I'm not about that life. I don't, I want to come back to school yeah. and I want to do better here. Son, you're too far behind. I said, Ms. Wilm, just give me, she said, son, you'd have to go to zero period, get uh, tutoring in the library at lunch. You'd have to get at, uh, at nutrition and lunch, you'd have to take a class at the end of the day. You'd have to go to summer school every single year and pass every single class just to graduate on time. Son, I'm sorry, you're too far behind. Mm. And I said, uh, I said, Miss Wilton, I said, I, I said, I feel like you've given up on me. Mm. I said, not you too. Not you too, Miss Wilton. Not you too. I said, Miss Wilton, give me a chance. I said, I promise you I'm gonna do better, but don't give up on me. Give me a chance. Please help me. I want to do better. Help me. And man, she stared at me. And uh she just stared at me for like felt like forever. And she said, son, I felt that. She said, I'm gonna give you a chance. And then she connected me with teachers and coaches and counselors and tutors. And then she said, son, you gotta work. Yeah. Son, the world ain't gonna care about your problems. You gotta work. And and that community of people helped me. But you're you're absolutely right, man. She was the gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. And had she not given me grace or mercy that day, because I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve. I mean, I, I deserved like I was acting a fool, man. But she gave me grace and mercy and gave me a chance. And that chance like really opened the door for me to show that I was serious. And I did have to work hard. I didn't know how to read too well and all of that, but you're absolutely right, man. And that's another reason why I talk to schools like and, and teachers and educators, because a lot of the people I feel called to reach don't come to our churches. Sure. They don't like, they don't go to church. And so my figure, you know, so I figured why not take the church to them? And yeah. I think it's in Matthew 28 somewhere where <laughs> We're supposed to be out there. Yeah. Um, and so, Lord, let me be salt and light. Let me embody your love and your grace and your mercy in these spaces to reach these little Manny Scots and the people who work with them. Because if we can get them in school, they still have a chance. But it's harder once they drop out. It's harder once they go to prison. Yeah. So let's get them before they get to that point. So you mentioned that as new chapters were written in the story of your life, you come in contact with this beautiful sister and oh, that begins man. a new chapter. Man, let's talk, let's talk family, man. And we already have understanding that you're a man of faith, but also a man of, of family. Uh, yeah. I got a, a whole bunch of questions, but I think one would be sufficient just to get us started off, man. Uh, man, describe your mission as a father, and share with me 
what you all have been doing over the past uh, nearing 20 years, I believe, to cultivate a, a love that lasts. Um, you're talking mm. to a guy who my wife and I just celebrated six years. So we're still- Congratulations. On thank you yeah. thank you thank you uh, i'm a blessed man i tell folk all the time <laughs> i married up god gave me a gift yes of sir my bride um not parents yet we'll see if that's written into our chapters going forward but anytime i get a chance to ask people who are further along the road than we are man what are you doing to cultivate a lasting love and describe your mission as a father wow so check it out man that's a great question um so to give you some context, um, where I'm from, no men stayed. None of our fathers were around. And so I didn't even think marriage was in my future. I didn't know how, I didn't know men could stay faithful. And I wasn't sleeping around like that. I just, I'd never seen a man stay. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen a man stay. And um, and um, I, 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 this Freedom Rider teacher, Erin Gruel, she took us out to this nice restaurant and I'm sitting to, sitting at this nice restaurant, you know, with all like it's 15 forks and knives. And I'm sitting there like, I don't know which one to pick up. Like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm feeling intimidated, man, all these white people. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. And she's like, man, just relax. You just, you know, go from the outside in, you're good. Yeah. Right? And, <laughs> and, uh, and um, while I'm eating, there's this family to my right that's sitting at this table. It's a white family. Mm -hmm. And it's a father and mother and three kids. And they're eating, man. They look happy and they they like laughing and just the kids are so well mannered. And I'm sitting there like the whole dinner watching this family. And I'm like lightweight for the cry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm, I'm lightweight for the cry, like, man, what's going on? And someone my, someone asked me, like, uh, my teacher asked me, she said, You good? I'm like, what's wrong? I said, No, no. I said, Miss, Miss G, I ain't never seen, I ain't never seen no father like eat dinner with his family like that. Mm. I ain't never seen that. She said, you can have that, you can be that. Um, and so when I talk about references, she, that man gave me a glimpse of my own possibilities, but I still didn't know anybody like us mm. who had done that. And I get to college and I meet this beautiful um, chemist, she, you know, she's just like, man, she was just gorgeous. Like, man, when she walked by, like the heavens opened up. Like. Yes. You know, yes. she was the one I hated to see leave, but I loved to watch go. She mm -hmm. was that one. Um, <laughs> and so me and my boy, my my my, my brother went on a fast. Mm -hmm. Like we went on a fast, his name's John DeCure. He's a pastor in Pasadena now. Um, he's he, like, he was like a mentor to me spiritually because he grew up in church. He's a PK. I mean, I, you know my story. So yeah. I'm just hanging out with John. He said, man, let's fast. Let's just drink water and pray. So we praying and fasting. And um, for about a week, it's about a week. Every day I'm reading uh, Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom mm -hmm. of God and his righteousness and all these things, right? So uh, I'm praying, Lord, today I just want to seek your wills. And, and me and John didn't even agree about this, but I said in my prayer, like, you know, I added a little part to my prayer. I, yeah, said, yeah. Lord, I said, Lord, if there's anyone, any woman that you see partnering with me on this journey of serving you, please reveal her to me. And he placed Alice on my heart. Mm. I didn't know Alice. I didn't, I had seen her one time. Mm. I didn't know Alice, but she, she, but when she said hello, something happened to me. And so I said, Alice, man, this girl, my boy, John said, boy, she, she man, look, she wears turtlenecks in the summer and skirts <laughs> down to her ankles and she don't got no jewelry or no makeup on. Bro, that's holiness, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm like, I don't know what that means, but she's amazing. Mm -hmm. Man, short of it is, like, you never see Alice come out of, you know, she was never on campus. She was always studying. But once every six months, she might make us, uh, you know, we might have an Alice sighting. Yeah, yeah. And my boy, my roommate was in a play on campus, uh, Black Theater Workshop. And I was just going out on a Friday night to support him. I get down there and uh, there's a line of like 40 couples and I'm at the back of the line by myself. The, the theater sells out and the guy, the cashier says, we got one ticket left. Is anyone here by themselves? I'm like, that's me. Yeah, yeah. I take the seat, I take the ticket. I go in the play halfway through and I'm like sitting in the only seat available and the light comes up during intermission and I hear, hi Manny. And sitting right in, right in front of me is Alice. 
and I said, thank you, Jesus. Like, yes, sir. yes, sir. There is a God. There is a God. Some, listen, he, he, he sits high and he looks down low. Yes, sir. Uh, he can get like him anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, man, the short of it is we became friends, fell in love, and and I'm like, this is my wife, but I don't want to ruin her life because men don't stay. Mm. I met this man named Walter Johnson. He was 62 years, he was, he was in his 60s at the time. He'd been married like 50 years or, no, no, he was, he was old, but they'd been married like 50 years at the yeah. time. And I pulled him aside. I said, hey, just between us, you mean to tell me, like, have you ever done a little something on the side? Just between us, because I need to know. Mm -hmm. And man, he said, look, he said, my father was a hound dog and he hurt my mama. And I saw what he did to her. He said, and if um, he said, when I when I get older and I get a wife, I'm never gonna make my wife feel like that. He said, son, a real man never loses the appreciation for the beauty of a flower. My goodness. He said, but I picked my flower. And so to answer your question, no, I've never cheated on my wife. Um, and I'm proud of myself. And we got these six children. And, and 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 so so no, I've never cheated. He became my father-in-law. Mm, um, <laughs> mm, mm. <laughs> that's, that's a real conversation. <laughs> that's a real conversation. So that's my yeah. wife's father. That's the only man I'd met up to that point that I believed had stayed faithful. Yeah. And so I've learned like so much about fatherhood and manhood from him. So we get married. And we go, we start pastoring this little church. I was on staff at this big church, actually, in Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. Go to seminary. And in seminary, I have this, I write down this mission statement for our family. The Scott family, I still have it from 2002. Um, the Scott family, it was just me and her. Yeah. The Scott family will be faithful and free. Wow. We're going to be faithful to God, faithful to one another, faithful to our children, faithful to our calling. And we're going to be free mentally, spiritually, emotionally, financially. We're going to be free. And brother, I kid you not, man, I wrote down my vision and my goals and I spelled out this vision statement. This is who we're going to be. This is where we're going to go. This is what we're going to invest in. This is, And for the most part, uh, that vision has become a reality. Mm. Um, and, and so I wanted to become like the best husband I could be to my wife. I wanted to love her and respect. And so, man, we had like the sweetest honeymoon period. Five years, no kids. Just wonderful, man. Like we was naked and unashamed. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> just celebrate Genesis 2.25 right yes, there. Indeed. <laughs> um, and then we were ready to share our love with others, with mm -hmm. children. So, you know, we stopped taking preventative measures. Yeah. Um, and shortly thereafter, man, we we were uh, she was pregnant, and we lost that child. Mm. Um, uh, you know, miscarriage, and we were discouraged. And then the and then about you know six seven months later, she was pregnant again with our first son. And um, brother, look, you know my story. Yeah. When we went to the 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 hospital to get the ultrasound and hear his heartbeat for the first time I have it on tape uh man when we heard his heartbeat um something inside me changed I said to myself I didn't my wife she didn't know about this for like 10 years but I said to myself like I was scared to death yeah. I'm like how do you become a father a good dad and you ain't never seen one like I don't want to ruin this kid's life and at that point, I wasn't the man I wanted him to see. Mm. You know, I mean, I, that's his, I was pastoring at, this, at the time. I was an assistant pastor of a nice church in Chicago. Um, but in, I'm like, I don't, I'm not the man I want him to see because he's going to be like me and I'm not that guy. Mm. Like, I'm, I'm just, man, like, up, I've been gifted enough to do just enough to stay ahead of the pack but I've never really applied myself. Mm. And so I'm like, man, I got to stop playing, man. Even though I can fool all the people around me in your heart, you know, you're not doing your best. And so that day, brother, I just started, my wife says, I, she's never seen me like work so hard 
uh, as when she saw me hear that heartbeat. From that day, I ain't stopped working. I'm wow. like, I gotta, I got, I got work to do, man, because I don't want to be the guy who's telling my kids, dream big, chase your dreams, and I wasn't, I didn't chase mine. Hmm. I wasn't true to mine. Like, I know God was calling me to do more, but I was settling for a paycheck. You know, it was a nice church, but I'm like, God, you saved me from a lot, and this is this is where the well-to-do African American people in the city attended. Lawyers, yeah. doctors, judges, beautiful people, beautiful people. But the people who needed me didn't come to church. And when they did, they sit in the balcony, drunk, high, some of these young brothers, gang members, they would listen to me. But behind my back, some of the seasoned saints ran them off. Wow. And uh, so I'm like sitting in this pulpit, just like, the people who need me don't come here. And churches like this ain't ready for people like that. Yeah. So God help me to serve, to live out this calling I feel like you have on my life while still providing for my family. Like, I don't, I like, I, I'm like, I don't want to be broke. I grew up broke. Yeah. I do not want to be poor, Lord. I want to serve you, but I've been broke. I don't want to be poor. So I'm, I need you to, I need you to make a way and I need you to provide. And so I stepped out, man, I resigned and the Lord released me from that church. And it was there that my ministry was outside the walls of the church. Yeah. And so he's provided um, for us in ways I could have never imagined. And so my wife and I have decided to homeschool our kids. We've been homeschooling them from the beginning. And so we are, we, we believe the purpose of life is to love God, love yourself, love others, and care about the world, care for the world, you know, and global warming and things Ooh. like that. Ooh. Love God, love yourself, care, love the world or love others. And you can't love others if you don't understand others, you know, so, and care about the world. So we we've been working to make them global citizens, sure. right? We've been six continents. Th these kids, man, like when they just talk casually, it's funny that the references they have, like, I love the acai bowl in Brazil or yeah, yeah. the noodles in Japan. And, and so our children, like, their their normal is extraordinary sure. it's and so my goal as a father has been to number one like not my favorite word in the world yeah between us just as a brother my favorite word in the world is daddy yeah um dad daddy because i've never been able to use that word mm. and so when my children say daddy dad man it touches my heart like it's a beautiful wonderful feeling when I see another, for years, when I saw another um, man hug his son, yeah, I didn't know him. I'd get emotional because I don't know what that feels like. I don't know what that feels like. And my goal is to make to make sure my my children never know that feeling yeah. that I've had to live with, the void that I've had to live with. I want you to know that your mom and your dad love you, and there's nothing in this world you cannot do. And... And so now when I joke about like leaving my wife and like, you know, man, I'm about to go get me another one and all yeah. of that. They laugh at me because and and I love that they can laugh. They know daddy's joking. They know yeah. that daddy not going to get milk and going to disappear for 20 years. Right, right, right. We never saw him again. Yeah. So my my really my goal, man, was is, has been to be faithful and free and to empower my children sure. to be faithful and free to love God, love themselves, love others and care about the world and to not look for a job, but to create jobs. Mm. Um, don't, don't go to school so you can find a job. Mm. No, you are gifted and blessed by God and the parents you've been given to be solutions to a generation. Yeah. And so you're going to live up to this potential. Whatever you decide, you're going to be the best at it. And 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 it's not like a a it's it's really setting high loving expectations. It's not oppressive or abusive. It's, wow. We believe that. in you so that. much. Yeah. That um, there's nothing you can't do, and mom and dad will do everything in our power to help you become that. Don't mm -hmm. get, we don't care about your grades. We care about your mastery of whatever mm -hmm. you're learning. Learn this, and if you learn it, your grades will be great. But sure. so we we've been homeschooling, man. We teach about 42 lessons a week. Okay. Math, spelling, grammar, reading, writing, history, geography. And we supplement that with travels. You know, we we are preparing to take a year long trip around the world. Let's go. Um, Let's go. Southeast Asia, the, India, the Middle East. 
three, four months in Africa and in Europe, come home and decide, um, Lord, where's our next assignment? Yeah. Is, uh, you know, do we continue serving schools in the United States or do the people of Africa, are you calling us to Africa? Are you mm -hmm. calling us to, to people around the world? But our, our kids are living in the middle of a story. They're seeing us live out our faith. Um, and it's not always predictable. It's not always pretty. But my son, he says, he says one thing about the Scots. It ain't going to be pretty, but we're going to figure it out. And yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> that's us, brother. I yeah. know it's a long story, but I, I love relationships. I love marriage. Um, and I love being a father. Uh, yeah. and, and if I could help any brothers or any families, any mothers out there, um, then I'll, I'll do my best because, brother, our families are hurting. Yeah. And another reason why I do this work I do publicly, I don't want people to have families that look like the one I come from, mm -hmm. the brokenness and the dysfunction and the abuse and the drugs and, you know, abandonment and all of that. I don't want, I'm trying to help other people change their narratives. Yeah. Your family might be messed up, but it can change with you. And, and I try to embody that for as many people as possible. I had the chance to witness a beautiful moment with you and your children on one of your recent vlogs. And, you know, like a book, there's a, there's a line in there that might hit somebody. Same thing with vlogs, man. There, there's a moment, and you might have vlogged it for this moment, but you never know what the moment is for the person watching it. For me, it was you guys were playing ball out in the driveway, you know, going oh, wow. head to head, man, <laughs> laughing, having a good time. And your team won. Uh huh. <laughs> and I don't know how you caught it, but there was maybe that fatherly instinct. Maybe you saw something. And your middle son, your, 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 your second son kind of was like, all right, I'm out. You know, <laughs> y'all can have it. He was heated. Yeah. It. But you, you went after, you said, yo, 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 come here, come here, come here, come here. And just that, that, that father running across the driveway to his son, right? Yeah. In terms of literal distance, it's not a long trot. It's, you know, I grab the ball, I run. But in terms of the difference that this could make in his life, it's a long run. I'm going to him to say, hey, this is a teachable moment. You allowed us to hear a bit of the conversation to say, yo, this is, this is life. You win some, you lose some. What can you learn? And for mm -hmm. me, beyond the words, it was just the, the experience with which you went. Because we know a lot of fathers, men even, could have could have taken it a different way. Could have been like, oh man, you know, go to mommy or go get go get a tissue. You you gonna you gonna cry? But man, you <laughs> ran to him, and that run, just that simple run, man, wow. was um. Of course, you know, the preacher in me was like, that's what God does for us. He runs right, to man. us. But in wow. terms of now, family relationships, I think that that was also a beautiful picture of all that you shared just now. That fatherhood, marriage, building family. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. fun, there's laughter, there's traveling, there's memories, there are memories made, but there are also off the record, lights off, no cameras are rolling. And I too am attending to the, the real questions, the uncertainty, the feelings that my children have. My wife and I, we talk, um, we smile, we laugh, we tease one another, we have pet names, but please believe there are also some, let's, let's come to Jesus moments, all of which are nurturing. So bro, um, I oh. love, ah, oh, wow. we're going to be free. We're going to be free. I love it. I love it. Oh, One of the man, ways blessing. God has given you all freedom, uh, man, your boy's a pilot, right? You know, you, you don't yeah. just sit on planes, you fly planes. Um, yeah. And I'm sure there, I just have two, two, two more questions, this one and, and one more. Um, sure. Man, the preacher in me assumes you've received no shortage of life lessons oh. in the air. <laughs> oh, brother, I'll be up there preaching to myself. Yes, sir. And would you mind sharing one or two with us of what you get while you're while you're taking to the sky? And and where did that come from in the first place? Did you always want to fly? Was that a necessity? What happened with that? Good question. Great question. Um, and let me say this about the father thing as I as mm -hmm. I move forward because I I don't like one of the my boys and the guys I kind of mentor. They call like I'll, I'll explain to them like they'll ask me questions, theological yeah. questions, questions about women, life, whatever. And I'll give them a nice like seminary answer, right? Yeah. Just, just this is the Greek says this and the Hebrew says this. And they'd be looking at me with this glaze and they say, okay, can you give me the hood pastor version? <laughs> and 
And so they called me their hood pastor because I'm like, all right, I could never say this over the pulpit, mm -hmm. but um, because a lot of people can't handle this, you know, handle truth delivered this way. Yeah. But let me break it down to you. So I keep it real, man. I don't feel like um, uh, there's a lot of, I don't think enough, enough honesty is being shared in the church, right? Like just, man, we got some real struggles and real challenges, but we don't talk about sex. We don't really talk about money. And, and so I'm like, I want to be honest with you because this could ruin your whole life if you mess this up. And, and, um, and so one thing about being a dad, man, is I want my kids to know uh, you can come to me about anything, mm. anything. You know, man, I, I initiate conversations. Uh, I don't want to put my son on let's, front. Let's talk about this. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I looked at your search history uh, on your on your computer, son, and uh, uh, I just want to talk to you about it. He started sweating. I'm like, no, I ain't no judgment. But as your dad, um, I just want you to not look at stuff like that. Like, if you have questions about sex and stuff like that, I want to I want you to talk to talk to me about it, because daddy, daddy learned about sex the hard way, like. Yeah at five years old, like I learned about a whole lot of stuff the hard way and that can mess you up, buddy. And sex can become your God yeah. and it can destroy your whole life. So um, I want you to learn about it in a healthy way. I want to be honest with you, but your mind isn't even ready to handle that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So um, man, we talk, talk, like, yeah. and, and I clown with them and I let them know I'm not trying to be a perfect example. I just want to be a living one. Um, I want you to see daddy's not perfect. You know, I'm not perfect. Y'all, you see me talking to these millions of people, but I'm just dad to you. And I want you to know I'm, the guy you see on stage, that's me, but the, that's the best of me. Yeah. That's the best representation of me. I want, I, they need to see that because they only got me for an hour. You guys see me all the time. And so you see me, you know, I might cuss here or there because I'm mad, or you might see daddy say something that mama don't like, and you might see mama not happy with me, and you, yeah. but I want y'all to see Daddy's not perfect, but we, but, and you don't have to be perfect either, as long as you're striving. Mm -hmm. But I want you to be, I want to be a safe place for you to always come about anything. Um, and, and, and I'm never going to lie to you. I might not want to answer it, but I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. And, and so as a father, man, when you, when you are blessed with that, if the Lord blesses you with children, just let them, see, you don't, you know, let them see all of you. Mm -hmm. uh honestly and help them and, and me and my my wife like she comes from a very conservative background i come from my background mm -hmm. we go to new orleans and you know bourbon street is wild man they got topless women out there and all of that my wife is like you think the kids can handle it i'm like look look i don't want my kids to learn about sex the way i had to learn about it i mm -hmm. want them to see the world as it is and i want to help them process it with a christian perspective Yes, sir. I want to help them process the, the good, the bad, the ugly with us so they don't have to learn about it from their friends or, you know, because the way I learned about it, you know, the goal of life is to go get you some. Yeah. And that's it. Like you a man, you ain't no man if you ain't getting none. Man, I'm in middle school scared of girls trying to figure out how I'm going to get some. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want it. I don't want my kid, like sex is beautiful and, sure. and God made it. And I want to teach you the game because there is a game. Mm -hmm. You need to learn this game, not to sleep with a bunch of women, but to get the one that you really want. And yes, there's sir. a game. So, man, we, we talk about the game. We talk about all of that. So be honest with your children uh, and it'll bless you and them. And it'll be mm -hmm. the most amazing experience to the pilot thing. Um, so as a little boy, I used to go to the airport and stand at a chain link fence and just look at the planes take off and land. Man, I'm looking just like, man, I just... Like, that's a man. I would just sit there for hours. I ride my bike to the airport and just look. It wasn't possible. It's, and people like me, we don't fly, but I, could, I, I, like, I like it. I would steal books from the supermarket about uh, Air Force pilots and stuff. I'd be reading books. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we can't fly. Um, got to high school, tried to join the Air Force ROTC, told me I had to cut my duck tail off. I was like, man, you tripping, dog. And I quit. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I needed someone to make me sit my butt down. I needed discipline. I left it alone. Um, went to college, graduated, start pastoring. You, you, as a pastor, you give so much to so many people. 
Um, and as a father, you're giving so much to your family as a husband. And then I'm traveling, speaking, I'm giving everything on the stage for people. And um, you just serve and it hurts and you keep serving and it hurts. And I got to a place where, you know, the cross is heavy and the burden is heavy. I'm like, Lord, I need something for me. Like I'm giving, I feel like, yes, my life is yours, but you know, I need something for me. Like I'm giving and I'm hurting. And um, I, I need some therapy. And uh, so let me, I want to fly airplanes. Mm. Oh, it was a pastor, a pastor friend of mine. Uh, he called me to, to be his teaching pastor in Oklahoma City. Um, Bob Long, he's, he's a white man who, he's just amazing, man. He, has his, he built his own airplane. He has like a, a sailboat. He built his own house in Texas and in Vail, yeah. Colorado. And he had an airplane. And when I, I reference it, this is references. I said, he a pastor and he got an airplane. Good night. And he would never let me he would never take me to the airport to see his airplane. He would never take me to the airport to fly. He knew I'm mean, asked my dream. I want to yeah. fly. He never took me. And so I was a little salty for a while. I'm like, man, why he ain't taking, you know, he know how much that means to me. Why he not taking me to his airplane? And so a little bit of my resentment was, well, man, I'm going to learn how to fly myself, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. This is happening all at the same time. Like, I don't need nobody else to show me their plane. I'm going to get me a plane. Like, that <laughs> decisions, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah. he got one, I could get one. So I start getting these uh, these lessons to just learn how to fly, and I'm loving, and it's therapeutic. Uh, and, uh, and then toward the end, I'm like, I travel for work all the time. I'm spending a whole lot of money on these commercial flights. Sure. I could get a plane for half of that price and it's cheaper, man. So we ended up getting us nice little six seat airplane and, um, and brother, we've been to most States in that plane. We ain't been to Alaska. We haven't been to Hawaii in it, but we've been on every state on the continent, uh, and the Canada and we've been to the Bahamas and we've been, you know, in this little plane. Yeah. And I've had so many life lessons and epiphanies and here's just one of them. Um, so on cloudy days and cloudy days, um, you know, when you're taking off, you know, there's, there's a cloud cover and you just can't see, you just can't see above it. Mm -hmm. But if you take off and you fly through these clouds and, and there, there are times where you can't anticipate the clouds. And sometimes you will be in the clouds. And when you're in the clouds, you don't fly by what you see. You fly by what's on the instrument panel. Yeah. And the instrument panel, it's a six pack. That you, that will save your life. Um, if you try to fly by what you see, you can experience what they call spatial disorientation. Okay. You will be, you could be flying straight a level and your body thinks you're like this. Mm. Or you could be flying like this and your body thinks you're flying like this. Mm. And so many, many pilots die because of spatial disorientation. And the only way to save your life and be safe in those situations is to not fly by how you feel, but fly by the instrument panel. Mm. You follow the instrument panel. And in the same way, man, the word of God is our instrument panel. Yes, sir. And our feelings might pull us one way or another yeah. we might want to do this and we might want to do that and that will lead to our own demise and death but if you keep your eyes on the instrument panel brother you will make it through the clouds and come out on the other side and see some sun yes sir um, <laughs> and so their lessons like that just hit me all the time man and i'm thanking god i'm i'm preaching while i'm flying like yeah it's, i'm ministering to myself um at just those kinds of things that are hitting me yeah. Uh, while I'm flying. So that's, that's, that's just real. one of many. That's real, man. Woof. Uh, baby, can I go get a pilot's license? <laughs> so, so check it out, man. When I get my plane overhauled, um, and so the engine, it's reached its limit. So it needs yeah. to be overhauled. Um, when I'm up in Virginia, man, I'd love to take you up and uh, let baby, you fly nice. a little bit. Yeah, I would, I would love, love that. I would absolutely love it too, man. Um, last question, man, and we're going to wrap it. Um, yes, sir. You're climbing the rough side of the mountain in your PhD journey. What's the focus of your research? 
So I'm looking at intercultural, uh, I'm looking at cultural self-awareness. Okay. Um, so, so in my travels and in visiting churches everywhere uh, for the last you know, 20 years, I'm in a different context every day. I'm, an, I'm with a different cultural group every day. And I've, I've learned so much about communication across culture, right? Your cultural universe is not culturally universal. And mm. a, a lot of times Ooh. people think that just because they're normal, they're, they're normal because of the, the group that shaped them. Like among that group, they're normal, but they are not the norm by which everyone else should be evaluated. Mm. And uh, we are culturally conditioned. We are inescapably, inescapably linguistically particular. So everything about us is culturally conditioned. Everything we say is linguistically particular. And if we lack cultural self-awareness, we can create distance with people and mm. not even know it. Um, and so I see it in churches. I see it in everywhere, almost everywhere I go there's this huge misunderstanding and these communicators and preachers are creating distance with people and they don't even know it because they're speaking from their normal yeah. and they're imposing and projecting their cultural universe onto others and, uh, and unknowingly and unintentionally communicating to people that, the, that you don't matter to me yeah. and your normal is not important to me or mine is better than yours. And there's this tacit, tacit ethnocentricity. So uh, I'm really interested in helping people develop intercultural communication competence. Mm -hmm. And the and one component of that is developing cultural self-awareness. Who am I? How have I been shaped um, culturally? And there's so many cultural yeah. categories. I got a new book coming out. I just finished it, 373 pages called <laughs> Teacher Secrets. Um, and it's 40 of the most powerful secrets I've learned through this work. It's for pastors, it's for teachers, it's for sure. anyone who talks. Um, developing cultural self-awareness, developing cross-cultural understandings of your audience so that you can um, relate your yeah. amazing content to their very particular context mm -hmm. in a way that they perceive it as relevant, as achievable, as worthy, worth their time. Uh, and so that's where, that's my sweet spot, man. I love just awesome. examining how communication, the process of communication and, and how cultural self-awareness influences what we say, how we say it, the, the text we select, the ones we avoid, mm -hmm. how we illustrate them, how we explain them, how we apply them. With, without cultural self-awareness, all you're doing is transmitting your culture onto someone else. You're just transferring your culture. Education is little more than the transference of culture when you lack cultural self-awareness. And, and so brother, that's my sweet spot. And I am um, actually writing my dissertation right now. And um, I'm just learning a whole lot. I've interviewed about 50 of the nation's most influential, effective, respected communicators, preachers, mm -hmm. pastors. And um, I've gotten all these epiphanies, a lot of confirmations. Uh, and I can't wait to share it. As soon as I finish it, man, I'll send you a copy of it. Please do. Please do. I, I'm eager not only for your dissertation, but also for the book that is soon to be released. Um, man, like literally no smoke. We could talk for another three hours. Um, yeah, but I this, my friends, has been just uh, a tip of the iceberg. You have had a chance to be introduced and reintroduced to Mr. Manny Scott, a man whose story um, cannot be packaged in an hour. And yet I do believe that you have heard something, you have laughed, perhaps you have cried, perhaps you've just been placed in to a space of deep reflection on your own personal story. Here's the message. You and I can turn the page, not just once, but we can turn the page multiple times in our lives. If you feel like you are languishing low, listen, you can fly, but I don't want you to misinterpret it or misunderstand. We're not talking about kind of a fly that is passive in nature, discipline decisions, work, and pay attention to those intersecting encounters with people that might be your opportunity to hear something, to embrace something and make a decision that can change your life, the lives of those around you. Hey, the lives of people who aren't even here yet. Maybe there's a spouse in your future and some kids yes, who need you to decide right now so that their lives will be different. 
I want you to go and check out www.mannyscott.com. Get to know Brother Scott more for yourself. Invest in his ministry. Follow him on Instagram at Manuel Scott and on Twitter at Manuel Scott. Receive more inspiration from him. I'm telling you, this well, is just the beginning. My brother, man, listen, you, brother. <laughs> I appreciate you. I appreciate you so much. And listen, I know people want to know as well, where can I get a Be Salty shirt? Is there a cash app, cash tag? <laughs> is there a website? You, you can't spread that. that. You've been flaunting it the whole hour. You got to know. We want merch too, man. Can they go to mannyscott.com? Is, is that where they go? Com. Yes, right. absolutely. So there's a little story behind this. Because a lot of people, you know, people who don't know, who didn't come out of the church or whatnot, oh. be like, don't be salty. Why are you being salty? <laughs> you know, kids, be salty. Sure. Um, but I was speaking in Texas, and I, and we'll end it here. I was speaking in Texas to some educators in Rockwall, Texas, and and uh, and uh, community members. And uh, when I was done, I opened up the Q and A, and this this man in the back corner, uh, he says, "Mr. Scott, thank you, sir. I needed this more than you know." Mm. He said, "But how do you reach that despondent, apathetic kid in the back of the room with the difficult parents who don't want nothing you selling?" How do you reach that one with his head down? I want to reach that one. Do you have any advice for me? I said, sir, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it. Before I could finish the phrase, this man over here cut me off, big cowboy hat on, this big bling bling belt buckle and this thick accent. He said, ow, Mr. Scott, Mr. Scott. He said, I beg your pardon, sir. He said, but I'm from here. Welcome to Texas. I said, thank you. He said, look, I was, I was born on a ranch. I was raised on a ranch. And believe it or not, I live on a ranch right now. I said, okay. He said, what you're saying about the horse is partially correct. Partially, sir. He said, it's true you can lead a horse to water and you can't make it drink. Fair enough. He said, but you sure as hell can slap some salt in his mouth and make him thirsty. You can make him thirsty, Mr. Scott. It's called a salt lick. And uh, I was like, I didn't know what this man was talking about. I'm from the hood. But I looked it up and found out, like, salt licks are a thing. Hmm. Salt licks make horses thirsty. And it hit me. I'm like, salt makes horses thirsty. Salt makes people thirsty. And my favorite book and my greatest influence says, you are the salt of the earth. And so who you are is enough to make this world salty mm. for more. And, uh, and so that's where I call my audiences to be salty. When you're tired, be salty. When you're discouraged, be salty. Because if you're salty, they'll be thirsty. But when they're thirsty, make sure you give them the pure truth. And uh, and so mannyscott.com, you can get your Be Salty shirt. We got black, we got gray, and we got pink in uh, from small to double XL. That's it. That's our limit. Yeah, Don't yeah. Be sending me no hate mail. because we <laughs> Bigger shirts. But that's it, brother. Hey, Pastor Martin, it's been an honor talking with you, brother. Thank you for your ministry. Uh, let's just stay in touch, man. Keep encouraging one another. Most definitely. Family, that's all we have for this episode of The Living Room. I'm your host, Richard Martin. Our special guest has been Mr. Manny Scott. Until next time, continue to listen, continue to learn, and continue to live.